countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Tuesday the 9th, 30 minutes to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe this hour? Well, European gas prices starting to actually dip. Um, this as the Russian state-owned energy giant Gazprom actually starts to fill storage sites in Germany and Austria. How much gas are we really going to get, though? The Primark owner, ABF, announces a big push into the United States. It's a bold bet after so many UK retailers have tried and failed to crack America. And staying in retail, Carrefour goes after Amazon with a plan to triple its e-commerce business in France. We're going to speak to the firm's CFO this hour. Let's take a look at markets here in Europe. Equities flat. Uh, you've got the FTSE down a bit. You've got some of the continental markets, the main ones there, uh, the CAC uh, and the DAX in Germany sort of in positive territory, but only just. Uh, but what we're really seeing as well is this drop in gas prices. We're down a little bit. We're down by a circa 6%. Some signs some signs at least that we are, Alex, starting to see Russian gas flowing into Europe. But still, as everyone's saying, like the next few weeks of winter really, really matter. Um, okay, here in the U.S., S&P is still trading a little bit heavy, down three-tenths of one percent. Guy pointed out in the last hour that if it did end higher, it would be the ninth straight trading day, and we haven't seen that kind of uh, continued increase in the S&P since 1964. That was a lot of fun. Okay, uh, individual names within the S&P. We got the upside General Electric up by almost 6%. Um, very much a splitting up story, getting some of that valuation pop. It's a sum of the whole uh, kind of worth more in that respect. Tesla, though, one of the biggest decliners within the S&P, down over 6%. Michael Burry of the big short fame, uh, known for his trades during the housing crisis, came out and said maybe Elon Musk should sell some Tesla stock to pay for his personal debts. Don't quite know where that came from, but the reaction in the stock, clearly evident. What is interesting, Guy, is that you're still having a very ferocious rally in the bond market here. The NFIB kind of missed. The producer price index came in quite hot. Question is, what will the CPI do? But it does feel like we're adding a lot of buying coming in. Maybe there's some short covering. We also have a 10-year auction, $39 billion coming later on today. Uh, so watch that space. will be fun. Guy? I, I think Elon Musk doesn't get paid by Tesla. I could be wrong about this, but no, you're this right. is what my understanding is. And he borrows against the stock. So maybe that is where the Burry line comes from uh, on the, uh, the debt side. Anyway, let's turn our attention to, to what is happening with some of the corporates here in Europe. Rolls-Royce, the uh, power company, raising $617 million uh, to fund the development of small modular nuclear reactors. It's basically raised the private money. That means the government is going to crowd in. Um, nearly half the financing on the government side is going to come from the British government. Now, last month, I spoke to Warren East. He is the CEO of Rolls-Royce about the prospect of bringing these reactors onto the grid. Um, this is what he had to say about that. In terms of when we're able to bring these things uh, to market, there is a regulatory process that we have to go through, and we're probably still looking around the end of the decade um, before that's actually uh, generating power. Warren East talking to me um, a few weeks ago. Rachel Moore, Morrison, even. I've got to get that right. Don't know why that happened. Joining me now <laughs> on set. Nice to see you. Sorry about that. Uh, talk to me about what these modular reactors are and why they're so important. Rolls-Royce has been pushing this story quite, quite aggressively recently. It's raising money. Uh, it's crowding in the government. But talk to me exactly uh, about what, what are we talking about here? What are these modular reactors and why are they so important? Yes, this is the government fund matching private capital that Rolls-Royce has raised for the next stage in the development of these small modular reactors. The idea is that they're smaller, they're quicker to build, they're easier to build than the big power stations that EDF is building, like Hinkley Point C and possibly Sizewell as well. So there are more of them. They can provide power in a different way to smaller communities, to towns, to cities. So they're much more flexible in the location. At the moment, they're looking at building them on sites of decommissioned nuclear stations. So those are places where people already are used to nuclear and won't mind another station being built. And this money's really being used for the development. So they're still trying to get the reactor design approved. And once that happens, that's when the project really starts to take off. It's, of course, 
seen as very important to Rolls Royce as the next kind of stage of development and what they can build and they can roll out this um, design to other countries. And for the British government, it's a British story, a British company building nuclear in the UK, mm -hmm. which is exactly the agenda they're trying to push um, with low carbon energy at the moment as well. Yep, I know a lot of uh, US utilities are also looking at the modular nuclear uh, situation as well, but it's been there for years. Um, Rachel, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison, uh, thank you for the update. All right, let's stay in company news here because Daimler reporting a higher quarterly profit despite that global chip crunch. Daimler CEO joined Bloomberg earlier to talk about the impact of that semi shortage. This year we have been mostly affected by the semiconductor situation, and uh, uh, we believe that the quarter three. Uh, was the quarter that was most effective and we are seeing a gradual improvement in quarter four and going into next year. But there is still an element of uncertainty here and the main chip suppliers have said that there will be restrictions also throughout the year of 2022. So we're not quite out of the woods yet, uh, but we like to believe that we're kind of seeing the worst behind us. Meanwhile, you've got chip manufacturer Infineon saying that chip supply will remain tight uh, next year as well. So here with all the details is Bloomberg's Stefan Nicola uh, in Berlin. Stefan, I'm wondering, too, what these guys are saying about this potentially being uh, a cyclical bubble. This is what happens in the chip industry or something more lasting, longer lasting than we're expecting. Yeah, well, Infineon certainly has said that the chip crisis will last well into next year and they don't really expect an improvement until the third quarter of next year uh, at least uh, in its own uh, working off the order backlog um, eventually there'll be much more capacity added um, companies uh, all over the world are adding chip making capacity that then down the road may result in a small bubble is what the Infineon CEO said but that's a small one and it will uh, taper off really quickly because demand for chips really is high and is likely to remain so Stefan thank you very much indeed Bloomberg Stefan Nicola on the auto industry and its struggles with the chip sector uh, let's turn to retail the discount clothing chain Primark planning on increasing its bricks and mortar footprint in the United States let's get more details now Didra Hipwell joining us on this Didra many companies and the list is long have tried to crack America why does Primark think it can do it and why does it think it can do it with bricks and mortar? Absolutely. The U.S. has often been the graveyard of British retailers' ambitions. I mean, most recently, Tesco failed dismally attempting to launch a grocery chain there called Fresh and Easy, and they had to exit the market a few years later with huge write-off costs. I think Primark's approach has been much more cautious. They tested the market first in the Northeast with only a handful of stores. They've adapted their range um, to tailor more towards U.S. consumer uh, tastes. The chain still doesn't disclose much granular detail on like-for-like -like sales uh, in the U.S., but the fact that they're planning a fourfold increase from 13 stores to 60 in the next five years would suggest that they're doing fairly well. And George Weston, their CEO, on a call this morning was talking about the fact that their stores in the Midwest and Florida are performing quite well. So it seems like they're starting to get a bit of a, a national um, understanding of the brand in the U.S. Uh, and there's plenty of retail space to go around. Um, Deirdre, before we let you go, we just got a headline. Well, the New York Times is reporting that IKEA is raising the minimum wage in the U.S. Uh, to $16 per hour. We also get a lot of retailers over the next couple weeks. Um, does this fit in line with what we're seeing from most retailers and wage hikes? Can you give us a little perspective? Absolutely. I think we've seen Walmart's done that. And in the UK, that has been a trend for some time. I think retailers at a time when the supply chain is in crisis are having to increasingly compete for labor. And in fact, just, you know, harking back to Primark again, they talked about the fact that they've had to increase wages for some of their truckers in the UK because there's such competition for them, given, you know, the supply chain issues. All right, Deirdre, thanks a lot. Really appreciate Bloomberg's Deirdre Hipwell uh, joining us there. And coming up later, stay with us for retail. Carrefour, as CFO, will be joining us to talk about the company's newly unveiled e-commerce uh, strategy. Talking about competition. What about Amazon? Guy? Uh, let's get back to what is happening in the aviation world, my favorite subject. We're getting numbers out from GE. Uh, sorry, not from GE. Boeing. The two are obviously <laughs> it's Tuesday. related. It's Tuesday. Uh, it is. It is. Just got to check the day of the week. Uh, Boeing, 720 gross orders, uh, 737, sorry, 373 net sales year to date. Um, October orders, 
uh, coming out on the website right now. Just read them through. Book 10 orders against three cancellations for October. Delivered 18 maxes in October. Uh, that includes six going to Michael O'Leary over at Ryanair. He's super excited about those aircraft. 27 jets delivered in October. The big question is, actually, in the aviation sector right now, is whether or not Airbus is going to hit its 600 target by year end. It increasingly looks like Alex like that could be a struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a struggle indeed. All right. Well, coming up, you got a surprise pickup in German investor confidence. We're going to break down that and what it means. Uh, Hannah Gooch Peters, uh, Sanlam Investments Global Equity Investment Analyst, will be joining us with her analysis. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg Password News. I'm Rishka Gupta. In the UK, Prime Minister Josh Boris Johnson is under fire over a lobbying scandal involving a Conservative Party lawmaker. His government has been openly accused of corruption in Parliament and even newspapers that are typically friendly took aim at Johnson's party. A new poll shows his approval rating at a record low. Vice President Kamala Harris is in France where she hopes to raise her international profile and continue to heal a rift between the U.S. and France. Speaking to reporters as she landed in Paris, she said she was looking forward to many days of, quote, productive discussions. U.S.-France ties have been strained in recent months. Russia's Gazprom is delivering on a promise Vladimir Putin made to Europe last month. The company is kicking off a plan to send natural gas into five European storage facilities this month. That should ease pressure on the energy-hungry country. Continent. European gas prices have more than tripled this year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg Guy. Rishka, thank you very much indeed. That gas story feeds into what I want to talk about next. German investor confidence unexpectedly improving in November. Um, this as we start to see maybe evidence that investors believe that Germany, the globe, will get through the supply crunches that we're seeing at the moment. Now, this is the pickup. This is basically 2020 here uh, into 2021. And you can see this big drop off that we've seen. And that was basically driven by the fact that Germany, highly cyclical economy, highly exposed to global trade, was seeing the effects of the global supply crunch. We were just talking about Infineon. We've been talking about what's happening with Daimler. You can see it all the way across the industrial space in Germany. But if you take a look at the details of the ZEW survey, investors are starting to believe that they can see light at the end of the tunnel, that things are going to improve. And as a result of which, in, in, enthusiasm is increasing, uh, starting to front run maybe the, the, the kind of the industrial reality of what we're seeing on the ground. So you're getting this little tick higher. Is Europe going to be able to work its way through this? Are we therefore going to see earnings picking up uh, into next year as we start to see maybe some of these supply chain crunches easing? Hannah Gooch Peters, Sandlam Investment Global Equity Investment Analyst, joining us now uh, to give us her perspective on this. Hannah, clearly, Europe, Germany, highly cyclically geared. We've got a lot of industrial companies. They're suffering at the moment. You've seen that being referenced, certainly in many investment calls that I've been listening to. Are we, though, starting to get to the point where we should be looking through this and expecting a pickup as we work our way into next year? I think we've seen big moves from those really cyclical parts of the market, like you're talking about, like those automakers, like those banks, which do make up big parts of the European market. I think the question from here is how far is there to go in terms of that? I mean, speaking of Europe, for us today, we're really pleased because we've had um, an announcement through from Bio. It's German listed. It's from the um, world's leading crop science businesses, and that's been up today. Um, the market seems to be um, thinking a little better in terms of the litigation news on that company. And, of course, crop science numbers um, are picking up, too. So we're pleased about that. We're also pleased to have seen um, some of our other journalist investments, for example, um, SAP in the enterprise resource planning space um, has been doing very well for us also. But um, in terms of Europe versus the rest of the world, there is still a big discrepancy this year between the performance of Europe as a whole up about 17 percent in dollars versus the U.S., up over 26. And so that divergence there is, um, is looking broad again at the point in time this year. It looked like it was starting to close. But again, if you compare that against somewhere like Asia, that, that disparity is even greater. Uh, so Hannah, overall, those are individual companies, but on the index level, I mean, the DAX is a little heavy today, but we're still right around uh, record highs. It feels in some ways similar to the US, even though there's obviously relative underperformance. Um, can you really buy at highs with the risks? 
or is there the rotation that needs to happen instead? I think we have to just be really careful about stock selection. I think that's true of everywhere, not just in Europe. There are pockets that are looking very, very expensive. And so if we look at Europe in particular, we're seeing the luxury goods space is still really being driven by the likes of your L'Oreal's or LVMH. They had a brief reset on that use of the common prosperity push in China, but they're still continuing to drive those parts of the market much, much higher. One of the largest companies in Europe, ASML, the semiconductor spot. If you look five years forward on a price earnings basis, it's still over 25 times um, price earnings ratio. And so it's still very, very expensive. So I think what you have to do is just look for opportunities and where you're seeing value starting to come through in pull vaccinating on, um, on news flow, for example, on earnings releases and um, take those opportunities when they come as long as the fundamentals are intact. Do you want to stay fully invested? We are fully invested. And uh, like I said, it's a, it's, for us, it's just about looking at careful stock selections, seeking opportunities where companies are at reasonable valuation versus the market. And as a result, we've got a portfolio that is trading on a, on a more reasonable valuation in the market. But it's because we're looking for those companies that have had those um, sort of pullbacks in valuations, if mm -hmm. you like, are looking slightly underloved compared to some of the more high-flying stocks that, um, that are getting pushed to, to very extortionate valuations in some parts of the market. Um, I'm wondering how you're looking uh, at margins then going forward. I mean, one is that maybe you're just not going to buy stocks based on margins to begin with. But um, how can margins be sustained when it does feel like there's a lot of input costs that will be rising at least in the next uh, 12 to 18 months? How does that distinguish your view? So for us, I mean, I think we have to look for, for companies that are able to pass those input costs through. Um, through their, their strong brand power without compromising on margins. A lot of quality companies can do this. If we look to one that's just slightly more, um, perhaps under uh, investors are starting to look at it slightly harsher, something like Unilever has, did pull back quite significantly because of investors' worries about margin pressure. But if you look over the very, very long term, this is a company that's been around for decades and decades. It's been here, it's seen this before. And that 4 to 5% top line growth may look a little pedestrian, but over the very, very long term, that is something that's able to vastly outperform the index over the long term. So we're looking for these companies that are, with these brands, able to eventually push these input cost pressures through without compromising their margins. Or indeed, look elsewhere in the market where then, you know, inflation isn't so much of a problem, like in your pharmaceutical space or in companies that are in your industrial space, which have those long-term defense contracts like General Dynamics that aren't impacted by inflationary pressures. How, how much of what you're doing at the moment is driven by what will happen with inflation and your thinking around it? So we look at everything on a stock by stock basis. We actually work on a on a on a, um, a theory that we do, we don't have an economist or a macro person within our team. All we do is look at uh, stocks on an individual basis on uh, every single day, and we look at the risks to those businesses and the investment cases behind them. And so, you know, if we're seeing margin pressure. Um, on a business, we will, of course, factor that into a model, but we are looking out very far into the future. And so we're not just focusing so much on short term pressures um, that are put on by the market. We actually you look at those for companies that have those long term fundamentals intact um, as an opportunity to enter them at, at better valuations. We're trying to look out past these short term inflationary pressures, which we're sure that a high quality company will be able to pass through um, with ease over over time. Hannah, we always love catching up with you. Thank you so much, Hannah Gooch-Peters of Sandlam Investments. Thank you very much. All right, well, coming up, maybe one of those input prices are actually going to ease a bit. European natural gas prices slipping on signs that Russia may actually start to deliver that boost in supplies that President uh, Putin had promised. We'll break that down next. This is Bloomberg. Russia's Gazprom says it is kicking off a plan to send gas into five European storage facilities this month. That's delivering a promise made by President Putin to the en uh, energy-hungry continent last month. Now, Isis Almeida is Bloomberg's team leader for gas and power over in Europe. Isis, it feels like the market expected this on Monday. Is this what we've been talking about, that they were going to fill the pipes? They didn't do it for two days, but this is it? That's right. Um, we were expecting it on Monday, and then... It didn't materialize. Um, prices went up as a result. And then suddenly we started seeing the first flows today. 
um, a 10 uh, million cubic, cubic meters um, a day increase through Ukraine, um, a little bit of injections into storage, but Gazprom really announcing that it has a plan to boost um, injections into storage and the five European storages that they own really move the market down today. We talked about this on radio yesterday. Are we at the point now where Russia doesn't have any choice but to start sending gas to Europe? Because basically it's used up most of the storage that it has and as a result of which the gas has got to go somewhere. That's right. I think the gas does have to go somewhere. Um, and Europe is a logical, you know, a logical area for it to go, not only because, you know, Gazprom really needs the European market. But if you think about it, Gazprom is also sending it to its own storage. So it's not like it's totally losing control of it. So do you think this is going to make a material difference? I mean, I understand the market's down today. But based on where we are for all income weather forecasters, based on that, is this going to be enough? Because right now, it's not that cold, right? So what's the best guess? I mean, definitely it's going to get cold as of tomorrow. Uh, not as of tomorrow, as of next week, which is what the forecast says. I think it will make a big difference because it will be in storages. And that is capacity and it's buffer capacity if, you know, prices go crazy and things get worse. Um, it really is going to depend on how much Russia actually sends. So far, the bookings for tomorrow, um, they've booked a 19 million cubic meters um, for tomorrow through Ukraine, which is slightly higher than they did today. Um, would these amounts change the picture? Um, not really. We need to see more still. Yeah. In terms of what Russia is actually delivering, is this over and above contract? Are we going to see an increase in spot in terms of what we're seeing delivered? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question because actually Gazprom is not selling anything in the spot market right now. So basically Gazprom Export, which has an electronic sales platform um, where the company uses to sell spot gas, one, it's not selling anything this week. And they announced that on Monday that they wouldn't do it. It was a second week in a row where they weren't you know, offering anything. And if you think about it, really spot gas for beginning of like next year and later this year, they haven't been selling since August. So um, is it above what they can do? Absolutely not. Hmm. Isis, always great to get an update. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, ongoing updates from Isis Almeida and the team uh, on the Bloomberg. Um, we continue to watch this and it's fantastic to hear Alex talking about the weather. Um, we'll finally You're rubbing off on me, Guy. Yeah, it's a bad sign. Yes. Uh, coming up next, <laughs> Carrefour going after Amazon in France. The CFO joins us next. This is Bloomberg. So we're wrapping up the Tuesday session for European equities. We're fading into the close. The European map behind me, as you can see, paints a fairly dismal picture. We're going sideways, basically. A lot of grey out there. We're just sort of dipping a little bit into the close. The cat can't make up its mind uh, whether it's red or grey at the moment. The FTSE's down by four-tenths of one percent. Some of the mining stocks uh, are coming off a little bit today. The DAX, absolutely flat. So after some really decent gains over the last few sessions, uh, we're trying to figure out what the next growth momentum is going to be. We're coming out of earnings season. What provides... The next catalyst, I think, is a question that a lot of people are trying to grapple with right now. But let's talk about how the session has gone. As I say, little fade into the close. We're watching what is happening stateside, but you can see that move towards the back end of the day. Stock 600 down by two tenths of 1%. Still, still in the 480s. Let's kind of be aware of that. We're kind of still up there. Record highs not too far away. We got up to 485 the other day. We fade a little bit off that, but nevertheless, uh, we're still at relatively elevated levels. Uh, in terms of the stock sector breakdown, retail's having a pretty good day today. A lot of the luxury names uh, at the forefront of that story, names like Caring. But you've also got stocks like Marks & Spencer. I'm going to mention ABF as well, uh, the Western family story, uh, in just a moment with, uh, with Primark. So retail, the big gainer, up by 1.2% today. Uh, you've got the luxury stocks in there as well. 
Real estate's having a fairly good day, which is interesting. Bottom end of the market, basic resources and the banks. Those are two heavyweight sectors, and that's adding quite a lot of weight to the downside. So let's talk about the retail story in a little bit more detail. We talked about it a little bit earlier on, Associated British Foods. Um, it's got a sugar business. It's also got the Primark business. The Primark business is looking to expand in a significant way over in the United States. The numbers we saw today, the, 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 the cash generation this business is producing at the moment, uh, we were hearing from George Weston talking about that. Uh, um, up by 8.1% today, the stock. Remember, this is, this is pretty tightly held by the Western family, all the Gs. Uh, Rolls-Royce up by 3.63%. Uh, it is raising funding for its uh, modular nuclear reactors. Uh, the government is going to come in and join that. Big step forward. The, the, the interesting story today actually is to compare and contrast Rolls-Royce with GE. Remember GE breaking up, big focus there uh, on the aviation business. That seems to be the one that everybody is looking at right now uh, to carry that GA, GE name forward. Rolls-Royce up by 3.5%. And then we get to Carrefour, uh, staying in the retail space. It is making a big push into digital. Now this has been a long time coming but they're looking basically to triple what they do. Now, this is, I would argue, part of reaction to what is happening with Amazon and part of reaction as well to what we've seen in the pandemic, which has shifted a lot of activity online, but a really big thrust being delivered by Carrefour into this space, Alex. Yeah, really big. A 3 billion euro uh, investment plan uh, into e-commerce, going to triple the value of the products it sells online by 2026. So this is some serious numbers. Some analysts really like those EBITDA, EBIC targets. So for more on Carrefour, want to bring in uh, Matthew Malige, a Carrefour CFO. Um, one analyst said it was rather impressive that you were able to have such specific EBIT targets due to this investment in e-commerce. Um, how much of this do you think that was brought forward because of COVID and the pandemic, and how much of that is truly expansionary? Well, it's clear, uh, Alex, uh, that um, COVID has accelerated uh, online consumption. It's now already a habit at our, at our consumers. We think that's just going to grow. We're not going to get back to the uh, pre-COVID world. That's just going to grow. We're taking many initiatives in that respect. And so that's why we're so confident to triple our GMV uh, over the coming uh, five years. Mathieu, you, you have in the past, this company has in the past, tried to do some fairly significant and transformative uh, M&A. We saw the deal falling flat in Canada. We saw the Ocean deal uh, not happening as well. Ocean uh, deal not happening. My question is, as you do this, as you push further into e-commerce, as you make this investment, it is going to strengthen your footprint and your ability to d deliver on digital. Do you think that is going to allow you to consolidate the markets with this strength in a way that you've not been able to before? Not every company is going to be able to deliver this. As you push forward, do you think you're going to be able to bring in other companies and consolidate the, the French market, consolidate the markets you're in? How much of a competitive advantage do you think that's going to afford you? Well, we think it's going to be a pretty significant. We think that uh, retail is entering into an era where digital retailers will be the leaders uh, of the industry. Retail, um, you know, in retail, digital is just not, just not e-commerce. It's about having data as part of your business. So you're right, if we're able to build the leadership around data, uh, we think that we will be uh, retail leaders. And so that puts us in a position to uh, uh, be able uh, to uh, keep attracting interest from a number of parties. We don't need consolidation, but when we receive incoming calls, we obviously uh, have uh, discussions with uh, people who show interest in, in Carrefour. So I'm just trying to read that. Does that mean interest as in them buying you or interest as in you still pursuing some kind of bolt-on M&A? Well, we, we are still pursuing our Bolton M&A. We uh, acquired uh, a company, the ex-Walmart of Brazil, at the beginning of uh, the year. Uh, so we, we are conducting our Bolton M&A. But it is clear that uh, today uh, we uh, announced uh, very big numbers in terms of digital because we think uh, that we can really make a difference uh, versus competitors. You need to be uh, in digital. The relationship to customers, the relationship with uh, data partners and the uh, strong footprint we're going to take into retail media, this is very strong and the key assets of a retailer of tomorrow.
We, we are seeing fast delivery becoming a increasingly competitive landscape. Gorillas is there. Others are getting into the space. I, what do you make of of the super fast delivery story? How is this investment going to help you with that? What do you make of the competition right now? Yes, we think it's a very important uh, uh, channel that is going to develop uh, in the future. We already have made uh, significant investments uh, in the area. Uh, we took a minority state stake in the French leader uh, called Cajou of quick commerce, so delivery to consumers in less than 15 minutes. And we partnered with Uber a few uh, weeks ago so that all together we have the best in class quick commerce offer to our customers in France. And yes, we think that this channel is going uh, to grow in the coming years. Talk to me a little bit then about margins. This business is hard enough as it is. <laughs> going into e-commerce when you have to spend so much is quite difficult. Put that in with supply chain issues, put that in uh, with labor issues. Can you give me an example of what your margins are gonna look like short versus medium term? Well, we think that's all the interest about uh, digital. Again, it's not just about having e-commerce. It's about building data. We have tons of data. We have 2.5 billion customers coming into our stores each year. We have today a data lake of 8 billion uh, data. So we can now extract value from this and partner with CPG companies in order to sell and share this data uh, to them. And all of a sudden, we have a new line of revenue that comes into our model. And we think that going into digital is a creative to our operating margin. And we expect that uh, digital will have an additional contribution of 600 million euro of operating profit by 2026. This is indeed a significant number. Um it would be remiss of me not to ask Mathieu about what is happening with the inflation story. How much inflation are you seeing right now? How much are prices going up? We, we see the, the FMCG company certainly pushing up prices. Nestle's doing it. Unilever's doing it. Um, how much of that are you able to pass on? Are you getting pushback from customers? What does the picture look like right now as we head towards the holidays? Well, actually, uh, the inflation in the European markets and at least in continental Europe where we operate is currently quite low. Inflation CPI today in France is below 1% so far, so it remains quite low. But clearly, we are entering into the uh, annual negotiations campaign for 2022, and we think that there will be uh, more inflation uh, coming into uh, the market for 2022. So we're getting ready. We are uh, sharing expertise with our Latin America colleagues who have experience in managing inflation about uh, being able to uh, limit the inflation to our consumers, limit the inf inflation that uh, comes to Carrefour from our uh, suppliers um, in order to go through uh, that period uh, ahead of our uh, competitors. Matthew, we're going to leave it there. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Hugely important announcement for Carrefour today uh, as you make this pivot. Uh, Matthew Melange, uh, the CFO of Carrefour. Let's check where European stocks have settled. Uh, this is we head into the break. Not much action during the auction prices, as you can see. Rather a negative session. We've drifted lower as the day or the afternoon, more exactly, uh, has progressed. Uh, but uh, we're down a little bit. I, I, I'm waiting to see what the S&P finishes at. I really, in some ways, wanted to finish higher so we can get that kind of headline. First time it's happened, nine days up since 1964. Alex? Party like it's 1964. I want to hold your hand. All right, breaking news for you here, guys. Uh, U.S. 30-year yield uh, falling to 1.805%, the lowest since July 20th. The whole curve uh, is bull flattening uh, right now. So just watching that, the headline... I don't know. Is it Brainerd? Is it Powell? Is it the data? Uh, is it position squaring? It could be all of those things. It's going to probably be wind up being choppy, especially as we head into the end of the year. Uh, talking choppy, coming up, Hertz has been in the news a lot, from an IPO to a potential deal uh, for EVs with Tesla. Uh, Bloomberg's interview with company's top executives coming next. We're still waiting for the stock to open. The last indication was it was going to open at 28. The offering priced at 29. This is Bloomberg. <music> Thank you.
This is Bloomberg Markets European Close. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room coming up. Larry Culp, the General Electric Chairman and CEO. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. U.S. climate envoy John Kerry says he believes COP26 negotiations will produce a deal on carbon trading rules. That would be a major win after more than six years of failed efforts. Kerry spoke with Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite at the Climate Change Summit in Glasgow. I'm for making sure we continue with fusion, we continue here. We're pouring our efforts into research across international lines. And I am confident, yes, that we can get there. Human beings created this problem. Human beings can solve it. Kerry added he was working with Russia and China to get them to participate in a deal to curb damaging methane emissions. In the UK, National Health Service staff who work face to face with patients must be fully vaccinated against the coronavirus by April the 1st. That's according to Health Secretary Sajid Javid. Care home workers have been told they must be fully vaccinated as of this Thursday. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So, definitely a positive U turn for the once bankrupt Hertz. The rental company is poised now to go public on the Nasdaq uh, today. We're still waiting for it to open. The last indication was about 28. Well, Bloomberg's Eric Chasker uh, sat down with Mark Fields, the interim CEO, and Greg O'Hara, the company's chairman, about the IPO and his plan to add Teslas to Hertz's fleet. We know our corporate travelers want electric vehicles to go visit their clients and, and, and do business in. We know our leisure travelers want electric vehicles. It's a great way for them to try electric vehicle without committing. And specifically, they want Teslas. They, they like Teslas and they like to rent Teslas. So in combination with understanding the demand is there and an opportunity to get a very hot product, an amazing product, that allows us to put it in the hands of people who want it was an easy decision for us. Tom, at the IPO price of $29 a share, you've pretty much tripled your money in the space of four months, which in and of itself is remarkable. As you know, there are some skeptics out there, haters, you might call them haters, they don't believe in your story, they say, Hertz doesn't have a firm order for Teslas. They say Elon Musk is dumping Model 3s. What can you say right here, right now, to address some of that, let's call it, confusion? Well, I think that there's no question that there's an incredible amount of demand for our products generally. We, we have uh, a very robust environment for the rental car industry. We expect that to continue. We're very focused on bringing products into our fleet, as Greg mentioned, that we know people want to rent. There's no question they want to rent Teslas. There's no question that they want to rent you know, higher value vehicles from all the OEMs. There's no question it's a big move afoot to electrification. So you know, for the people who doubt what we're doing, um, you know, we, we would simply ask that they stay tuned and uh, watch what we have to come because we think that this is just the beginning of an effort to put Hertz at the center of mobility in a way to serve our OEM partners and to serve our customers to provide a better rental experience and a better corporate partnership with those parties. Mark, these other guys here, Tom and Greg, they're financial guys, right? You're a real economy a really good guy. CEO. <laughs> you ran Ford. You know all about operations and execution. What are the biggest challenges Hertz has to overcome in this move to electrification and the transition to what we might call shared mobility. Yeah, well, first off, first off, I, I don't look at it as challenges. I look at it as huge opportunities because we're really staking ourselves out, I think, a very important place in, as Tom mentioned, this mobility ecosystem, wherever mobility 2.0 goes. Obviously, clearly, as we look to lead in electrification, making sure we get our charging infrastructure in place, that's happening as we speak, and then be able to, you know, that first mover advantage of learning how to manage these large electrified fleets I think is going to give us a very big competitive advantage, not only in the near term, to, as Tom and Greg said, to get customers into these vehicles that they want to drive, but more importantly, you know, in business, you have to start looking around the corner. So as you think about autonomy down the road, those large electrified fleets, I think we're going to be well positioned to work with a lot of different partners to make that happen. Eric Shatska talking to the Hertz executives a little bit earlier on. It's interesting just the focus that is placed on EVs and this transition we are going to make and everybody's trying to figure out how that's going to work 
And ultimately, where the point of value is, Alex, is it in building the cars? Is it managing the cars? Uh, it, there's still a lot to be decided here. Obviously, we have uh, a, a, a series of companies that are trying to sort mm -hmm. of get in on this. Everybody's trying to sort of burnish their credentials. I, Volkswagen has had a huge run as a result of its kind of epiphany moment. We are going to become part of this. We're going to take a play out of the Tesla book uh, and we're going to run with it. Hertz in some ways trying to get that halo effect off Tesla as well. Yeah, exactly. And I also wonder sort of what kind of valuation would be on Hertz because uh, of this Tesla agreement with, with Eric Shasker tried to get uh, some clarity on. Um, and I wonder how, which of these guys will be cannibalized by what, right? We have the Rivian IPO that's going to happen, bring a price later. Yep. Uh, it's going to be trading tomorrow. Like how many of these do you want to be owning? And do they at some point cannibalize each other? Well, we don't, yeah, you don't know who's going to succeed, who's not going to succeed, or is the pie going to just grow and everybody's going to get a piece of it? Uh, as you mentioned, we're going to get that IPO coming up. The US electric truck maker Rivian seeking to raise, let's call it circa $10 billion in an IPO. That gives it a circa $70 billion valuation. It could be the seventh biggest US IPO on record, which is absolutely amazing. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow tracking the story uh, with a great deal of care and detail. Ed, is this the new Tesla? Is that what we're looking at here? It, I, can I draw a line between what a Tesla has done and what Rivian's going to do? Just walk me through the dynamics of this particular business and its IPO. Yeah, certainly market analysts see it that way as the next Tesla. You know, it's an astonishing valuation for a company that has built less than 200 trucks so far, delivered less than 200, and will only build 1,200 this year. It's interesting here you guys talk about Hertz. You know, the whole thing around Tesla and the Hertz deal is it's not easy for Tesla to suddenly deliver 100,000 vehicles to anyone. Mm. They are themselves supply constrained. And that's this question about Rivian as well. Well, hold on. How can this be a $70 billion automaker when it's going to take them years, literally, to ramp up to a level of production where, you know, they are a meaningful player, let alone a, a seller to fleet operators like car rental companies? Uh, so to that point, um, some analysts have been talking about the natural constraint that Rivian will face. What is that right. natural constraint? Yeah, so, you know, they are going after something that's been missing. Think about electric vehicles out there today. They are sedans. Tesla focused in that area. Well, hold on. Americans don't drive sedans. You drive down any highway, they're driving pickup trucks and SUVs. So when Rivian had this big coming out moment in 2018, suddenly everyone was like, finally, a big bulky SUV, a big bulky pickup that can compete performance wise in the EV space. It's interesting, like Guy in London, Rivian, as we reported in January, is looking at a European site, potentially in the UK. Well, hold on, it's the opposite that's true in the UK. People do not drive pickup trucks and SUVs. And the big part of the valuation, if you read the commentary, you look at what investors say, is that they've raised a ton of money and they have a really clear roadmap to the future. It starts with that pickup truck you see on your screen here in the United States and down the road leads to smaller form factor vehicles in other uh, jurisdictions like Europe, like yep. China. Hmm. What is the Amazon connection here? How does it work in favor of this company? And, and Amazon, what is Amazon looking for right. from Rivian? Yeah, I mean, sources tell us that the valuation is directly tied to Amazon's investment in Rivian. It holds 20% ownership interest, and it has an order for 100,000 delivery vans. It has exclusive rights to those for a period of four years and the right of first refusal for an additional two. Amazon has great influence on this company, but it's also a great marketing boost, right? If you have Jeff Bezos coming out on stage announcing to the world that Rivian is at the heart of Amazon's carbon reduction strategy, it will help. Um, but also it means they have their own products competing with those of a really important and influential customer. And there's a limit, right? Supply chain constraints and all. Ed, great stuff. Really looking forward uh, to when it prices later on today. Ed Ludlow uh, of Bloomberg, thank you very much. This is Bloomberg. All right, coming up in the next 24 hours, lots happening. We just talked about Rivian, got earnings from DoorDash and Coinbase. Also, Fed's Neil Kashkari is going to be speaking. Uh, and we get U.S. WASDI report. Yeah, I'm pumped. That's coming up at noon. It's the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Forecast. Woohoo!
We've also got the short-term energy story coming up. I yep. know you're also super excited about that. Uh, we've got PPI today, the big number tomorrow, CPI. Really looking forward to seeing exactly what that data delivers. Will it move the bond market? Wholesale inventory is also out. We've just been talking about the Rivian IPO, very much focusing on that as well. Uh, our producer, Nicole, will certainly be paying attention a great deal to love Disney. Disney. It will be out with the, with the numbers, yeah. It is a surprising interest that she has. The level of interest is, is bewildering to me on a daily basis. Ten cents also out with numbers. Uh, Alex, Dr. Fauci is going to be joining David Weston on Balance of Power. That's coming up. Uh, you and I are going to Bloomberg Radio, the cable on DAB. This is Bloomberg.